Welcome to Crimson Guitars, welcome to my home studio, and welcome to Luthier's Question Time, episode 55. These things have been going on for quite a while now, and uh, and I'm still loving it, I hope you are. Uh, this is a live stream on the Crimson Guitars Extras YouTube channel, and is going to then be edited down into a podcast for the podcast reader of your choice. So, um, yeah. If you don't fancy listening to me waffle for an hour and a half or so, you can go and download all of the previous episodes and listen for a whole hell of a lot longer. Anyhow, this is uh, this is a question and answer show. I need your questions. Uh, if you have any in, and you are uh, lucky enough to have the time to uh, be here while I'm live, hit me in the in in the top chat in the. Uh, in the live chat and if not then uh, well come back next week or send us an email stream at crimsonguitars.com or join our discord server where there are also uh, areas for people to send questions for me to answer during the stream uh, anyhow we have got a bunch of the uh, a bunch of the normal people in Creeferai is a moderator for the evening garage master guitars Gramasar and Faborden Joe Smyjohn Jr. Gramasar saying that he liked the uh, he liked the video two days ago, and he's just been waiting ever since to see whether it was actually worth liking or not. Uh, Jaybird Customs in the house. Good afternoon to most, and good evening to the rest of you, he says. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Leon, first question, says, Leon, hi, everyone. I'm not sure if I'll make the stream, so I'll drop my question early. One, which of the crimson finishing products is the best to use of the Wenge top? Two, what is the best way of application? So Wenge is one of those things. It is fantastically um, porous. It's got really, really hard uh, grain and then really soft grain in between with nothing much going on in between and large, large gaps and things and that. Those gaps and the open pores give it, uh, uh, as long as it's cut, uh, if it's cortisone at least, and it gives it a lot of the character that we love. So, uh, personally, I would not, if you've got a cortisone thing and lots of open grain, I would not use grain filler because it takes away from what the wood wants to be. And I would suggest uh, just a standard uh, penetrating uh, guitar finishing oil. Don't even go to the uh, higher build guitar finishing oil, just a penetrating guitar finishing oil and you would, you'll be done. And uh, build it up a few times and go from there. Uh, the application of that, if you want a glossier finish, then I would apply it uh, initially, put as much as will go on, uh, and this will fill, it would it will penetrate as a lot. And uh, it will keep on sucking in and keep on sucking in. And once you start to see the oil build up on the surface of the wood, at that point, then you need to wait for it to start curing which in a normally uh, in a in a workshop with a normal temperature uh, you know not too hot not too cold to work in uh, will take about 10 minutes and as it starts going off you rub the excess away now with open poured woods and wenge is the worst of these uh, you've rubbed away all of the excess the top is absolutely dry you can only just sense that it's been wet recently with if you put your hand on it but come back and look at it another 10 minutes later and probably 10 minutes after that because you have just flooded the pores of the timber with oil some of it sometimes spooges back up and that can dry hard and solid and that would mean that you would have have to go back with wet and dry paper and uh, rub it back and then apply your next coat of finish and you don't, don't you want to avoid that if possible if as i started saying earlier you want a higher gloss finish than you would normally get with an oil then on your second and third coats uh, and fourth if you feel like you need it start applying with progressively finer wet and dry papers starting at about 1500 grit and this will create a small slurry made up of some sawdust and some dried oil, etc. It will fill the grain to a certain extent, uh, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, something like that. And if you apply that and then 10 minutes later rub the excess off, you'll have a fantastic finish. If you want a perfectly flat finish, 
than grain filler of some sort, you can use... <sighs> Well, there are many, many different products out there. Uh, frankly, a good quality blonde shellac uh, applied with uh, wet and dry paper, uh, creating that sawdust slurry or even guitar finishing oil done in that way will fill the grain nicely. And then a, a 2K lacquer over the top. Uh, we don't sell 2K lacquer, you specify crimson products. Uh, I would at that point say uh, a water-based guitar finishing lacquer or a melamine lacquer depending which of the two you fancy um, but yeah uh, I think th there are there are many many different ways to finish an instrument and uh, well I'm still experimenting every single time I do it so there we go Whew. okay SC guitars is the other moderator and he's in the house uh, Tommy transplants talking about ghosts have we... Uh... Oh, you all saw that. Okay, fantastic. I wasn't sure if you would see that or not. <laughs> um, so as I was talking, I hit a cobweb that had, somebody had planted uh, just above my head, and that was annoying me. And as I was talking, it slowly moved its way past the right next to the camera lens. Uh, I couldn't on the image see if you could see it or not, so I decided to ignore it. But yes, uh, ghosts, uh, everybody. There we go. Um, okay, Robert R, I can't quite make out the end of your question. Uh, it says, hello, Ben, I like the redo of the Shrek build posted yesterday. So that was a, a super edit of uh, the Shrek uh, episode. Um, but I was hoping at the end of the video, I hoped you would refinish the top. Oh, well, there we go. I saw the next part. There's a, a limit to the amount of characters you have. Uh, I am still in two minds about that. I really am. In fact, she's sitting just off camera there. I broke a string the other day, so I've brought it down to replace that. And I'm thinking, do I or do I not? Uh, I don't know. Um, Anthony Cuncliffe says, uh, what would be the minimum amount of bare ass basic knowledge you prefer people coming in a course to have? I'm appreciating you do cater to novices. Cheers. Uh, honestly, the fact that you are even interested in building a guitar in the first place and definitely interested enough to be you know, watching this sort of a show, uh, whether it is uh, mine or, or, or somebody else's, uh, shows that you have the minimum amount of knowledge. All you really need to have in order to build a guitar at Crimson Guitars is the will to do it and the ability to pitch up and, you know, and try and learn. Uh, we have had a few people, a very few people out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that we've taught who really didn't put in the effort, um, which I find incredibly strange. But uh, other than that, almost everybody manages to get what they wanted to get. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is people who want to build, you know, a Stradivari in, in, in five days, and <laughs> that's just not physically possible. But, um, yeah, so, frankly, come along. Um, there are people who come who have never used a hand tool or a woodworking tool of any sort in their life, ever, period. Uh regularly we find people who've come in and uh, they've done the barest of DIY work at their house, for example, stuff like that. So, yeah, bring it on. Inky Guitars says, uh, for your next build, would you consider making a bog oak fretboard and then do inlays based on a, on, oh, on a black book of hours? The pages are stained black. Um, that really appeals to me. I... I um, one of my favorite watches uh, is a it's a ceramic Tudor fast rider with uh, red indices and it's black ceramic with with a black dial and the only highlight is 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 the red and there are other ones uh, there's a an Amiga Seamaster coming out this year where it's just black on black on black in fact it's called the Seamaster black black and if you haven't yet, go and check out an image of that. It looks 
so incredibly cool. And doing something with multiple different um, shades of black in one build really appeals to me. So yeah, at some point, maybe not Book of Hours inspired, but the whole concept of black, 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 and black, and black. Yeah, I'm on that. I would love to do that at some point. Uh, Lucifer has come in with the first super chat of the evening. Thank you very much. And uh, if you uh, really want me to see the question and want to support the show, then uh, uh, yeah, super chats are the way to do that. And I really do appreciate it. So uh, Uthover says, hi, Ben. How do you recommend locating the holes for string through ferals? I'm using a tunematic bridge. OK, so uh, with a tunematic, I, I tend to have the four base strings and then uh, the four bass strings in a nice angled line and then the two higher strings push back a little bit and then they carry on that same angle uh, and I'm not entirely that was the way that I was taught how to do it that was how I was told how to do it and it does make a certain amount of sense with regards to the tension of those strings as you're playing them uh, I've never actually done the experiment to see with, for example, a standard set of 10 to 42s, uh, how much of a difference I can create by moving the position of those string ferrules uh, in relation to the other string ferrules, etc. Now, the marking out is quite simple. Uh, I think 11 millimeters is the gap uh, that I want. So I will draw the line across wherever I want it in whatever orientation I want it and then uh, 11 millimeter uh, center to center and uh, now here is where the trick really comes in. I drill the two outer strings on each line all the way through. So if you've got, for example, six in one in one line, you've all got you've got all six strings going straight through the body in a, in a nice line, and it's fantastic, as you would have on a standard uh, hardtail bridge, for example. <clears throat> then you drill all the way through on the two outer strings, and you only drill halfway through the body on the four on the inside. You then flip the guitar over, see where the two outside holes came through, and hopefully. You've used a drill press or a pillar drill, um, and uh, they are nicely lined up, and, you've, and it's fantastic. But what you can then do is you flip the guitar over, and you draw a line between those two points, and you again mark out your 11 millimeters center, uh, center to center, and then from the back of the guitar, you drill the four uh, in the middle. And that allows you to make absolutely certain that uh, at both sides, you have everything lined up as well as you possibly can. Now, if, for example, you're doing this with a Wenge top, like the previous commenter, uh, you need to be supremely careful that the drill bit does not wander. Uh, you need a center point drill bit. Um, I use either Fermag or Star M. I've got Star M here in this workshop. I've got Fermag in my studio at Crimson Headquarters. And uh, they are very good quality uh, center point, brad point drill bits. And uh, yeah, if you're worried about it, make sure that your pillar drill or drill press is clamped down so that the table's not going to move, so that everything is lined up. Clamp the guitar to the table so that nothing's going to move. And then very slowly make your, uh, make your holes. And uh, there we go. <sighs> One final tip on that subject is to put masking tape on both sides, actually. If you put a, a strip of masking tape down and then burnish it down to the wood, uh, if the drill bit does decide it wants to tear through, uh, i.e. going through, that sometimes helps to, to minimise tear out. But as you're, as you're drilling into the masking tape, that also stops uh, tear out uh, from happening uh, 
when you're drilling into the into that area. So uh, yeah, any little bit helps. And at the worst, you will still tear out, but the bits that you need to glue in are yeah stuck to the masking tape. So I think that's that. If anybody else has a comment or a favorite method for doing this, then uh, please uh, reply at Lucifer uh, in the comments and uh, we will see and discuss the merits of them. Rad Knox is in the house, Garage Master, uh, Brian Harris uh, says, hello Ben and everyone, I hope you're all well. I'm having very well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I hope you are too. Greg Freeman and Jessica the Wonder Dog have also joined. Okay, this is a question via Discord from Crumpet. It says, good evening Ben, I have a potential idea that could maybe be done on the Crimson Guitar social accounts. I propose this week at Crimson where a few notable slash most interesting things related to Crimson Guitars that happened that week are highlighted and shown off, uh, such as some of the guitars made that week, videos uploaded, new products when applicable, etc. That is a very, very good idea. Um, uh, and uh, that was me learning how to screenshot on this device. <sighs> This is the phone that I force punched into a clamp about six months ago, and it's just come back and been repaired. It, I fumbled it, grabbed it by with both hands like this, and smashed it into the corner of uh, of one of these with the nice square edge. It, it hurt. It, it, yeah, brand new, brand new phone. But anyway, tools are there to be used. So. Uh, yes, that's a really good idea. I, I there is a hell of a lot going on at Crimson. It is epic and scary and insane and just mind blowing how much change is happening from the the, the fundamentals of who's doing what. Um, it's it's crazy. So, but moving forward. <laughs> well, here we go. There's, there's currently 75 of you, 77 of you watching, uh, and only 41 likes. Uh, yeah, there's a lot happening. Uh, we're hiring. We're hiring uh, people in the production department. We are hiring guitar builders. We are hiring all sorts. Get in touch. Most definitely get in touch if you're a guitar builder. Uh, and uh, we are working on a new, longer format guitar building school. So uh, as opposed to the, the three-month students, students that we currently have, we are going to look to have uh, longer courses uh, for people who live in the UK already uh, a year and with the option to actually work three days a week at Crimson on the production guitar so you get experience fretting and uh, sanding hundreds of bodies etc and for people who don't have the right to work uh, in the UK we are trying to put together a six month course or a 180 day course for people from the EU and America where uh, we kind of try and work around that but uh, yeah, it's a work in progress. Uh, but on top of that, just staff-wise, uh, we have uh, <sighs> it's a lot of changes. What am I even talking about? Yes, so next year, over the next year, everything's going to change. Uh, f the amount of videos that is that are created is going to slowly ramp up. Uh, the amount of super edit style videos where you'll just see social media posts of a, a certain guitar made on you know cnc's and a, a custom shops kind of thing and you'll see a few photographs of it and then suddenly bam you'll have a 45 minute uh, video on youtube and, and that's that um, i will still be doing my long-term projects which will you know episodes episodical that's the word but uh, there's going to be a lot more social media a lot more photographs and a lot more cool stuff and i'm going to be working out of the headquarters uh rather than at home as i have been for the last two years so gonna be fun <sighs> okay 
<laughs> okay, funnily enough, next question is Marston of the Nuclear Village. It says, hi Ben, are there any news about that apprenticeship idea of yours from last week? That sounded like a perfect solution from for me. Even moving from Kent to Dorset wouldn't be hugely problematic. Uh, it is confirmed, it is happening. Uh, if you are interested in doing it, then please uh, drop us an email, office at crimsonguitars.com. Say that you are interested in the year course, uh, that you are based in the UK and uh, you want more information, and we will get back to you. Some of the finer details are still in flux. We are still talking to our solicitors verse, uh, with how we need to physically set it up, but legally it is all absolutely fine. Uh, so it will be two days a week, uh, Thursday and Friday, as students building whatever you want to build, uh, learning as much as we possibly can teach you as you want to learn. Uh, <clears throat> and then three days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you would be working in our production department, uh, starting with uh, some basic tool making, sanding down leveling file handles, for example, stuff like that, uh, to get your iron, then moving on to production kit guitars, then kit necks, then fret work, then custom shop uh, kits, moving on to full custom shops, and ending up maybe even doing... Uh, well, the sky's the limit. Uh, this is also <laughs> this is also the very very best chance of getting a job long term as a uh, as a luthier at Crimson. If you are interested in that, um, we are also looking for teachers at Crimson Guitars headquarters. If you have that experience, okay. Uh, thank you, Martin. Good question. <sighs> uh, Joseph Smyjohn, how's it going, Joe? You're right. Um, says, what would you charge in US dollars to make another custom bridge identical to the bridge you made for Shred, but the saddle's, saddles made out of brass or copper rod instead of steel rod? <whistles> Honestly, I'm not allowed to quote. I'm not allowed to quote. Uh, I think it was two or three days work, really. So it's not going to be an inexpensive bridge. There were some changes to the design that I mentioned, I think, in the video itself, <laughs> if it made the cut. Um, so flat bottoms and bits and pieces. But uh, yeah, it's something that we could absolutely do. Uh, I would need to properly revisit the instrument and have a look at them and figure it out. But um, let me... Uh... Yeah, Stephen is listening. Stephen, if you could send that to Sam... And then Sam will nag me and keep on nagging me until I've uh, sat down with him and we've worked it out. That's the best way to get things done, uh, is to get somebody else to just peck at me. Uh, okay, well, there we go. He said, yeah, through the office. Um, <laughs> uh, I very carefully put a, 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 a the new Crimson Guitars cap in the background, just as a bit of marketing, uh, it's available. There is a, there is not a sale going on at Crimson Guitars right now. Uh, there is, however, ten percent off anything at VintageToolshop.com as a uh, a moving, uh, i.e., please buy it so that we don't have to physically lump it over to Crimson Headquarters uh, when we combine the two companies in January. Uh, but yeah, ten percent off anything at VintageToolshop.com if you fancy it. Um, okay, Garage Master Guitar says, Hi Ben, using my off cuts, uh, using my off cuts, my neck blank isn't long enough to get both the heel piece and the headstock from. I'll need to decide which one. It begs the question, how long? I've allowed for the scarf angle cut. Does the headstock need to be? Uh, you need to allow space for the machine heads, but what else? I have a bit that after cutting my scarf would leave 140 millimeters, which should be fine if a bit on the short side. Honestly, uh, that is not a question that I can answer. Uh, point blank, you have to draw your guitar out that you want full scale. Uh, now, with scarf joints, I've started seeing people putting in random bits of highlight wood uh, in the scarf as well. For decades and decades, everybody tried to hide the scarf joint. Um, and uh, yeah, it was seen as the, the cheaper way of building the guitar because you're not wasting so much material. 
uh, and that was a bad thing. Whereas nowadays, you're trying to utilize as much material as humanly possible, and uh, using a scarf joint is actually not a bad thing. So there we go. Okay, question from Fred C. Reed uh, says, um, I'm making my first guitar. The body is not uh, arched. It's carved too, but the neck that was sent to me has a Les Paul angle to it. Can that work with flat-topped guitars? Uh, no, it cannot. So he's shown me the sort of the traditional Les Paul uh, tenon joint with the angle cut into it. In fact, with what looks like a very, very hefty angle cut into it, uh, you would have to go in and chisel <laughs> yeah that's an interesting one so you've got the angle on the back on the end of the neck you need to flatten that to 90 degrees to the fretboard and then you need to flatten the base of the tenon uh, probably in your case adding more material would be the way forward um, but uh, yeah i would suggest get a different neck and keep that one for when you want to do a carved top, to be honest. Okay, question from Malcolm says, uh, I love watching guitar build vids. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about bolt-on strat neck angle. Um, can it be adjusted by loosening the screws and turning the adjustment screw? Uh, okay, sorry. Being that if the neck is moved slightly off from the body rather than putting in a shim, does this alter the tone much, if any? As I heard, there's, there's very little punctuation in this sentence. Uh, as I heard, if there's a gap, it does. <sighs> Keep up the great vids, uh, vids, all the best. Thank you. Okay, so in my opinion, yes. If you've got one of those uh, strat systems where they've got the, the little screw that you push up, that then does push the neck away. Obviously, as you said, you've reju uh, tightened loosened off the four main uh, bolts it leaves a gap between the back of the neck and the body and everything in me says that, that is going to suck some tone out of the instrument and and it will now the addition of a great big grub screw pushing against the back of the neck does go some way to ameliorate that situation but not all the way so no i would say don't use that uh, get a shim, make a shim, use the masking tape and super glue trick to do that. That makes that particular task much easier. And go for it. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Wire has come in and said, hey, I want to try a burnt guitar finish, like Ben does in his videos. I have a quick question. Does the airy brush, uh, that's a spelling... Uh, uh, Autocorrect. Does the wire brush not leave lots of scratches in the guitar? If so, how do you get rid of them? Any help would be great. Um, so, uh, not really, no. And because, okay, use a little, very fine wire brush that is designed for uh, looking after your suede shoes. Yes, I am actually wearing suede shoes today. Woohoo! Um, yeah, suede shoes. A little suede shoe brush will do it perfectly fine. It's uh, relatively uh, relatively fine, but strong enough to remove the waste, and it doesn't leave huge amounts of scratches, which is uh, which is what you're trying to avoid here. Um, yeah, there we go. I ha there are a couple of videos. It's uh, Shusugi Ban. So search Shusugi Ban guitar, and uh, that should give you the answers you lo you're looking for. Okay. Anthony Cuncliffe uh, says, thank you. It's just to see what I can try to learn that would help me get the most out of the course. I have some funky ideas. Uh, we work with you as much as humanly possible prior to even you pitching up. So if you if your ideas are funky, then you might need a two-week course, for example, or even more. Uh, but we will make sure that you're on the right course for what you want to do. So the first stage really is to email uh, through to crimsonguitars.com, office at crimsonguitars.com. You'll probably end up talking to Ricky about the courses, and he will then go and talk to the tutors about what's um, if there's anything particularly um, off-piste. They, they're used to people... Uh, 
who watch my videos uh, wanting to do some crazy shit, so I apologize for that. Okie dokie. Yeah, Joe, we missed you last week. Uh, I figured you were driving somewhere where uh, you didn't have a signal, so uh, yeah. Now. Now. I, I have no questions. Give me questions, people. Fine, I'll go back to the phone. Hey, Ben, how many guitars did you build before designing they, deciding they were good enough to sell? This is from Jaybird Customs. Honestly, um, I sold guitar number four, uh, which was a custom order from my drummer at the time. And it was actually an okay instrument. It really was. Um, but... I burnt guitars two and three. I think number two got burnt. I've still got number one. I think I've still got number three, actually. Uh, and uh, a few of the others of the first batch of ten. Well, not batch of ten. In the first ten, I got rid of a bunch. They just weren't good enough. Um, so, yeah, probably ten, really. And even so, out of my first 50, there were things that I... I lie. There are things I'm not happy about, about pretty much every single thing that I make. But that is just being an artist. That's just being a maker. And it is par for the course, I think. Uh, and if I don't think if I, if I didn't feel that way, I don't think that I would get as much out of the act of doing it. And I don't think my guitars would actually progress any. With complacency comes poor work um joe joe sent a uh, super chat thanks joe and said uh, uh not the first super chat of the stream but i had to get one in not a question with us just a super chat because i just emailed it lol uh no, thank you very much i really do appreciate your support um uh, there's no question there i can't i've got nothing i've got nothing more to um more to say. Are you going to start building guitars on the road? Have you got room for a workshop in your cab? That could be cool, actually. Uh, Marshall Levine has also sent a, a, a $10 super chat. 10% uh, off at Vintage Tool Shop. I want all the tools. But do I need them? Uh, yes, you do. Does it matter? No. A plane? A hand drill? What about a mallet? More files? Tiny chisels? Oh, hi, Ben. <laughs> Good to see you all. Uh, <sighs> I really struggle going into the tool shop and the fact that it's actually moving to Crimson headquarters and I'm going to be working out of the same place all day, every day. There could be problems. There really could be problems. Um, I think I'm going to have to learn self-control. Uh, not that any of you need to learn self-control. Please go to VintageToolshop.com and uh, buy as many as, as take your fancy. Um, planes, hand drills, mallets, files, chisels. I have more than I need of all of these things. And yet I still want more. And I hope that hope never goes away. Well, that, 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 that lust. Okay. Um... Fine, Creeper Eye. Uh, okay, uh, Joe Smyjohn sent another email through. said, which one would you use on a personal guitar neck? Ebony, Purple Heart, or Curly Maple? Uh, personally, I wouldn't use Purple Heart. I don't enjoy working with Purple Heart. Uh, Curly Maple, if I had a full spray booth uh, access to 2K Lacquer, and I would be very, very tempted to try and um, try and cook it, basically. I think that could be fun. Uh, turn it into roasted maple. In fact, I really am very, very tempted to try and build a vacuum chamber around the uh, the oven we've got at Crimson for cooking wood to see if I can do that. All oh, the super chats are just coming in. Um, fantastic. But really, ebony, ebony is ebony is what I love. Um, 
So out of those three, I'd go with Ebony most of the time. And that's, uh, this is stripy Ebony we've got here. It's pretty. It takes an oil finish rather than a lacquer. And it's easy enough to work with. Uh, Stephen Clark's come in with a $5 uh, super chat. Thank you very much, Stephen. It says, on a, uh, on a bolt-on neck, what are the benefits of using the screw ferrules as opposed to standard washers more commonly available at hardware stores? Okay, so... Um, a standard washer is not finished to the same level of quality, for one, but it's also uh, not very chunky. Uh, whereas the the inserts that you're uh, alluding to uh, on the back of the instrument, where the where the countersunk head of the screw sits inside the back of the guitar, uh, those tend to be four or five millimeters thick and are very strong and help with help keep the whole thing together uh, not only that they are properly chrome plated or gold plated or black plated for the most part and just look better quality than most standard washers you would get at a hardware store so uh, from point of view of looks from point of view of strength and stability and all of that I would just go with a proper countersunk counter sunk um, insert so yeah uh, Joe's come back in with another ten dollars and says uh, I have most of the tools needed for the mobile guitar shop except for a planer and I'm halfway through collecting the material to build the drum sander for acoustic builds I have been so tempted to try and build a drum sander um, though that's out of the out of the basic machines that most hobby guitar builders need or really really want that is the expensive one um, they are i think new for the cheapest available um thickness sander uh they're about 1400 quid or probably even more at this stage i haven't looked recently uh, it is possible to make them. Susie Gardner did a, a build of one uh, that I don't think I ever finished watching, although I did see the final result. Um, and various other people have made them. And yeah, it's a fun project. At this stage, I'm just, yeah. I'm very tempted to buy an industrial one for the head, for headquarters because uh, we're hoping to go into uh, supplying uh, guitar timber as well. But uh, yeah, so you need a... Um, a planer and a drum sander those two things are probably not going to go on the road with you but uh, uh yeah you prep the wood before you go and uh, and then go away and build uh that is if i didn't if i through some twist of fate was still me but had to have a normal job that would be my ideal world drive around doing the normal job have the workshop with me and then just stop wherever I am no cares or worries or responsibilities and just make guitars it till midnight and then sleep for three hours and get on the road and carry on that would be where I'd end up okay Spike Frugal Fixer Guitars uh, was considering burning my acoustic build but when I saw the results of hardwoods burn the results did not move me uh, like it did on softer woods. I hate to mess up this solid sycamore body. Do not burn your acoustic build, you will destroy it. Shusugi Ban is for thick material. It is um, Vulcan. Thank you very much. Uh, Shusugi Ban is for thicker materials. I, I think I mentioned this last week. But uh, so for an acoustic, you would cause all sorts of stresses that an acoustic guitar would not like. Just would not like. Uh, mentioning burning hardwoods and back to the previous question about which fretboard I would choose I'm going to change my answer Purple Heart after the Shusugi Ban technique uh, Burnt Purple Heart has this amazing look uh, if you don't, don't go too far and then sand it down. So essentially you take the, all of the char off, you end up with this beautiful purpley black. It's just really cool. So yeah, I would do that. 
Um, Vulcan Essence Center, 20 euro super chat. Thank you very, very much. Um, says, hey Ben, how should I diagnose a fret that causes buzz? Uh, my base E buzzes unacceptably, unacceptably between the 4th and 16th fret, um, while A and D just buzz slightly. Strings 10 to 46, so good. Um, I think we put 10 to 46 on pretty much every guitar we build at Crimson now. Yep, that's exactly what I've got down there. 10 to 46, tunematic, fall away. Fret rocker clean. Okay, well that's my first answer. Uh, the, the first thing is use a fret rocker with a medium action. Ideas? Thanks. Cheers. V. Uh, I love how you sign off. I, <laughs> I went back and watched um, v, for v for Vendetta the other day and I think that I did it almost solely because <laughs> Because you're in, in here and you sign off as V and it, it's just got that movie in the back of my mind. It's still a pretty cool movie, actually. Okay. Um, for, you're saying here that you've used the fret rocker and the fret rocker is clean, so there's no uh, rocking. Uh, for, for everybody else who gets this question, the first thing to do is exactly that. You use a fret rocker, you hold it over three frets, and you try and rock it. And if it does rock, then you've either got a low fret on one of the outsides or or the middle one is too high and you move around and try and figure that out. Um, it is still possible that you have... My, my next thing after that is I wouldn't trust the fret rocker if I've still got buzz. I would take the end of a, a nicely polished screwdriver or something that's not going to mar the metal but that is solid you could even actually use the small end of the fret rocker and push down on the end of each one of your frets and just very carefully watch the fret and see if there's any movement in the fret now this is the the great big sleeping ghost that can get you sometimes with fret work and uh, essentially when you're leveling it if the fret isn't, hasn't been seated properly in the build process or hasn't been glued in, and this is one of the reasons why I, I use glue, uh, even though the fretboard is holding the fret in, um, then as you pass over the fret, uh, if it's loose, it will be pushed down and you're not actually removing material from the top. It's just pushing it out of the way. And you can do the same thing while you're using the fret rocker. It pushes it down, no rock pushes it down there's no rock but then when there's no tension the fret still pops up that's the second thing to check the next thing is to make absolutely certain where your fret buzz is coming from it could very well be um, it very could well could be a washer underneath your tuners for example so uh, this is another thing that comes up quite a lot if the if the tuners if the wood of the headstock has shrunk a little bit uh, since the guitar was built um, the tuners are still there the wash is still there but the threaded section is now higher and the wash is just rattling underneath underneath the tuner so uh, so that is an option um, and uh, I don't know what guitar this is. It, uh, if you've got the ability, uh, if you've got string trees, uh, change where the string trees are, uh, change the tension of the uh, of the string. That could make it. Uh, that could affect things. Uh, and you said it's got a medium a medium action. Obviously, you need to check the truss rod, and uh, oftentimes adjusting the truss rod and then playing with the uh, the saddle height. Will fix this sort of problem. So what I want to do is I want to put my finger down on the first and the final fret and I want to see maybe half a millimeter gap. Hell, less than half a millimeter, a very small gap. I want to see a very small bit of relief and then and then I'll adjust the height of the saddle. <sighs> to try and get rid of that. If your nut, if your nut slot, nut slot is too high, then that is another way to cause buzz. Um, so in other words, as you're pushing down, you're not only changing the intonation point because you're putting more tension on the string that you need to than you really want to, but um, 
that the whole geometry just doesn't work out. Finally, another hidden buzz, which doesn't it doesn't sound like this is what you've got, but another hidden buzz is where the nut slot hasn't been cut properly and on the bridge side of the nut the slot actually goes down a little bit and the way to diagnose if that's the issue uh, because obviously the slot wants to go down towards the tuners uh, put your thumbnail on the bridge side of the string and push down and if that stops that buzz uh, sort of sitar like noise then you need to recut your nut slots uh, this is a question we get fairly regularly and it's almost impossible to act well it's basically impossible to diagnose uh, it's one of those things where you just have to go through every single possibility and find it out and then yeah what was it terry pratchett said one in one in a million chances come up five times out of ten or something um you will often find a never before experienced way of causing buzz and uh, it's just one of those things so good luck uh, i would suggest it's probably some combination of action and um, neck relief yeah play with the neck relief play with the action and you should be there uh joe has come in with another super chat another ten dollars thanks very much joe uh, it says the drum sander is based on the Supermax 1936 design. If I'm not wrong, that is, we've got two jet sanders that are, uh, I think, probably made by the same company as the um, Supermax, if not of that same design. And I'm going to eventually get the jet 10 inch bench top uh, jointer planar combo, which I do have room for on the truck. That's incredible. Do you have power for something like that? Well, you must do, because you must do. I've often thought it would be supremely cool to build a, a just to build a traveling workshop into an old horse box or uh, um, or bus or something. Um, I also really like my creature comforts. You know, I, I like my bed. I like my own pillows, and uh, most importantly, reliable Wi-Fi. So I'm probably never going to do that, but. We're there. All right, guys. Uh, 99 concurrent viewers, only 58 likes. 102 viewers and only 58 likes. Bring on the likes, please. It really does help. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I appreciate your support. Um, okay. I'm just going back over Vulcan's question there. The buzzers between the 4th and the 16th fret, it really sounds to me like your nut is too high. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of a high nut and the wrong, um, relief. Bourbon Sherbet, I haven't seen you in ages, I don't think. Um, how's it going? Sent another super, sent a super chat, thank you very much, and says, you sexy beast, you. You sexy beast, you. Can you go into or make a video about how you create a headstock? <laughs> it involves sitting in a corner crying. Why can't I come up with an original headstock? Um, arranging tuner holes, angles, templates, secret source, etc. Uh, the secret source is to start with an existing headstock. Seriously. Um, headstocks are one of the most difficult things to design. And yes, I, I really do actually think... Um, bum, bum, bum. You know, I'm literally writing that onto the <laughs> tissue paper on the workbench. Um, this really should be a video on, on that subject. Now, start with something that works. Many people believe that straight string pull is the be all end all. And it does make a difference. We, I would not suggest go and make a guitar where the strings just go off at a horrific angle like... Um, oh, crikey, what was that company called? Let me know in the comments. Um, so get relatively straight string pull. Do a PRS. 
have the two outer strings with nice straight string pull and then obviously if you've got a three aside neck and then splay out the inner two just a little bit and that gives you enough meat in the headstock to to play with okay now arranging tuner holes you it's just a case of drawing these things out as as many times as you possibly can and uh, and going and crying in the corner but uh, wherever possible i will start with tuner holes set by a template so i will go to crimsonguitars.com or if there is another uh, luthier supply store who you like uh, find find plans find templates and say look i'm going to take the prs headstock i'm going to use the the, the holes, the, the tuner positions, and I'm going to then adjust the headstock around to suit my, my taste. <sighs> From there, you've got the basic geometry, both in the right position so that it looks right, because we've coalesced to something that looks around about what it should, if it's a three-a-side headstock, for example, uh, but also will function properly, uh, just through trial and error. Trying to reinvent the wheel when you've already got decades and decades and decades of other people having done this thing means there's no real point to it, is there? Um, now, the limitations that we have with headstock design is one, uh, String tension, so the, the brake angle and all that affects tension. And I would say you want to, for preference, you would like to have a headstock with a brake angle of, say, 9 degrees. 9, 10 degrees is your perfect catch-all headstock brake angle. Um, string length, you don't want the tuners to be so far away from the headstock that you've you know unnecessarily lengthened the strings. This will just change, make it just feel weird because it's not normal. Um, the aforementioned straight string pull will affect to a certain extent uh, whether the strings stick in the nut. Obviously, you can always recut the nut and make that work a little bit better. But the outline of your headstock, the outline of your headstock is limited only by the fact that we use standard manufactured tuners. And all tuning keys, or m most tuning keys, they have, they've got a tuning head that is a certain distance away from the shaft of the tuner that goes through the headstock. If you are a machinist, or have aspirations to be a machinist, or quite frankly, just want to make a cool tuner, you can take the tuner, take the tuning key off itself, get a longer screw and lengthen, well, you can either lengthen the entire tuning key head itself, or you can uh, add a new section in between the tuning key and the body of the tuner just to push the whole thing out. So at that point, you could make a square headstock if you want, and the tuners could still be where they are. They're just longer tuners than standard. Um, this is something I've done several times over the years. Uh, there are other guitar builders. Michihiro Matsuda, I think, has done this. He will hand carve, looks like hand carved, ebony tuning keys that are really long, like four or five centimeters long. And this allows him to play with the headstock design. And uh, was it the Matt Bellamy guitar that has uh, knurled uh, tuning tuning keys that has very small diameter, which means you can also push the tuners closer together, but you can make those any length you want. So, well, there we go. That was a fairly in-depth answer. Uh, let me know if you have a secret source of your own and uh, yeah, go from there. Leprechaun says, we can all be happy we aren't building 12 course Renaissance lutes right now. Hell yeah. 
And that is an instrument that I really, 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 really... Dean guitars. Creever says Dean guitars, that's it. Uh, Creever, um, lutes scare me. I think now, after building instruments for 20 years, actually I could do it. But forever it's been the sort of thing, and it's the geometry of the, the curved back that just, just scares me every time. Ah, Sweet Tea Guitar says, is there some general rule for designing a headstock? So a six in line should have, or a three by three should be this way, you know? Um, essentially with the six in line, pretty much it's the, the, the position is set of, of the tuners. You do want them to have straight string ball. Anything less just looks strange. Uh, those Kramers where they sort of splayed out with the hockey it looks strange and it doesn't serve any purpose and if it doesn't serve any purpose other than to look strange then i should be put out of business i shouldn't make videos <laughs> wow i'm arguing against my life here um yeah if there's no real purpose to a thing then why do it um unless you can use the argument art which is what I'm going to use. There we go. For art's sake, everybody. Um, but with the three in line, no, not really. You don't want it to be too far away from uh, from the nut. But other than that, not really. By too far away, you're talking four, five centimeters, maybe. <sighs> Stephen Clark's thinking about another show. We could do a Crimson where it's a staff talking business together, candidly on camera, or just generally putting you in the space of behind the scenes of Crimson. I am going into and creating a dream workshop with uh, uh, Luth, well, Luthies that are there currently, and hopefully Luthies that are going to be, be coming, and we're going to be filming more, more videos uh, as a collaboration uh, than we have ever done before. And it will literally be hey, we've had this person order this strange guitar. Uh, you go and cut that on the CNC. You go and get the welder out, Tristan. Um, I don't have anybody called Tristan working here for me. And um, it's all filmed and it all comes together and it makes a, a cool show and it's more behind the scenes. There's more of Crimson in them than the videos currently have, which is just me, hell, me and my shed at home filming things. So, So, yeah. it'll be they'll, they'll, yeah it's going to be more fun because there are going to be more people involved and uh, it's going to be fun Ravenwolf Guitar says, hey, quick question. I placed an order with Crimson on October 29th and it hasn't shipped yet. Just curious what the delay is. Wow, that's two weeks. That is a problem. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we have uh, some issues, not some issues, but huge changes. And one of the huge changes is that through... Okay. This is, this is the place for being totally candid, and um, uh, I'm going to have to be careful in how I say this, because well, I don't want to be an arsehole. We spent a large part of the last year at Crimson trying to survive a pandemic. And uh, in some ways that was we're losing a huge amount of money because, for example, we've had to close the school and we didn't want to lose any staff, so we had them doing guitar building and other stuff. In fact, we took staff on. Um, but also, um, it really showed where our limitations were with staff that we had manufacturing the tools that we manufacture in-house. And we're not like any other... Uh, guitar tool makers that I know of in that we do manufacture a lot of it in-house and even stuff that we have to have outsourced to a certain extent comes in and then is, is worked on. 
And unfortunately, what it turned out is that we had, we realized that through the insane amount of orders that were coming through because of lockdowns and, and stuff, we realized that we actually didn't necessarily have the right staff in the jobs. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not been fun the last couple of months, but we have a drastically reduced workforce. Um, that in so so yes, um, we're at the stage where we have had to uh, replace some people uh, who were working at shall we say a quarter speed and actively losing us money, and we went through the whole process properly, and it was you know okay. This person can make that in half an hour. If you can't make it in, say, 40 minutes, then we need to talk. And this was done over months and months and months and months. And it all basically came to a head over the last month. And uh, we are now starting fresh. So there are some delays on some things. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I made a sweeping <laughs> statement in the video where I gave my daughter's guitar a, a thing saying, hey, you know, here's a coupon code. So on top of that, there's been extra sales. But it's actually at the point where management are now making the tools. Uh, they're actually better by far than they were a couple of months ago. Uh, we're a little bit delayed. But please drop an email and say, uh, well, you should have already had an email um, apologizing and letting, you, and letting you know what is going on. So if you haven't had that, please let me know through stream at crimsonguitars.com. Okay, uh, Disco Stew is coming with £4.50 as a super chat and said, Howdy, in a world where you don't need to think about the video, what guitar would you build next? No pressure for likes, comments, simply just for you. Whew. I just clicked off that just fast enough. It's just disappeared off my screen. Okay, that's a more fun question to answer. Um, but just to go back to the last one, we've already got uh, new staff in place, training is in, in hand, and uh, we are uh, catching up at a rate of knots. And I am so incredibly excited. Uh, there, there were products where we were literally making a loss. Every single one sold was costing us money, and the school was subsidizing that. Uh, with the school not in existence because of COVID, a lot of things came to light, and it was just complacency and trust and trusting the wrong people to a certain extent. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been hard, but it is going to be so, so much better. I am. I, I have not been this excited about Crimson Guitars since I started it 15, 20 years ago. All right, so. This begs the question, would I personally build more guitars if it wasn't my job? Uh, and at this stage, if you'd asked me that two years ago, I would say no. <laughs> I've done that. Let me, well, two years ago, I, I would have said, let me build miniature staircases because building miniature scale models of staircases, which serve no purpose other than to be supremely cool and beautiful to look at. It's, it's a hobby that I would love to have. Uh, but I have recently, over lockdown, fallen in love with guitar building again. So if I wasn't filming it, and if it wasn't to be filmed, yeah, I would spend a year building myself probably a Gibson L5, something along those lines. Or maybe even more uh, a jazz guitar based on De Quisto's work. Uh, you know, just, or D'Angelico even, so bags of binding and beautiful sound holes, uh, sound ports with uh, that adjusted and opened and closed so you could adjust how loud uh, they were, and the 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 the, the timbre, etc. 
Yeah. It would be something along those lines. But a big part of why I do this is not the guitar itself, it's the video. And it's not because I earn my living through making videos. It's because I personally get an insane amount of gratification and the huge endorphin rough rush from seeing you guys enjoy what I do. Kenneth Gordon has come up with another super chat and he says, uh, When's Brand X guitar no longer a Brand X? I give new life to broken guitars, not resto, but custom modern proof. I usually say it started life as. I think that's a, a valid point. I often wonder why we aren't in the guitar world uh, in any way like the car modding community. Uh, and I suppose it's a question of scale, but uh, car modders will take, I don't know, 70s Mustang or whatever, and they'll modify the hell out of the, the thing. And it's still a 70s Mustang, but it's got all of these extra bits and, you know, nowadays 3D printers or <sighs> water jet cutters, etc. You can put all sorts of uh, ill-advised bling on them. But, uh, but it's still the art of actually modifying it to turn it into something cool is lauded and people people follow these customizers these custom builders and they're not they're starting with the platform and then making it their own whereas if i took a prs custom 24 <laughs> and ripped the frets out modified the inlays i should do that because i would have a million views on that video no doubt um <laughs> I really should do that. Customize PRS Custom 24. Um, people would be horrified, literally horrified, if I did that. Uh, I don't like this gloss on the back. I'm going to strip that off and make it, you know. I, uh, Matt, I, I I don't like these inlays, so I'm going to build on the bird inlays that they've done and and customize them. Um, this headstock cap sucks. I'm going to put a bit of coca bolo on there or uh, insert your eco friendly timber of choice or carbon fiber. I mean, I don't think Pyrrhus has done a carbon fiber guitar. Now, this could be fun. Let's take a ten top Pyrrhus and and slather it in carbon fiber. <laughs> oh, I don't know why that uh, amuses me so much. Um, if it was a car, you'd have a million people watching it because you're doing something incredibly cool with a car and you're giving it a new lease of life, etc. But if it's a guitar, you've got these anoraks shouting at you. I've had death threats for a, a PRS video I did many years ago when I um, relicked it. There, there are literal people saying, I'm going to find you and kill you. And luckily I didn't believe them. <sighs> yeah. So there we go. I think it started out life as, is a very good way to put it, and or you could say customized by um and yeah i think that's valid you're, you're giving a nod to the past you're giving a nod to what the guitar started out as but it is your brand and there are there are famous car modding uh, people out there who um i think overfinch is the only one that actually comes to mind to my mind now but uh, if you've got a Range Rover that's customized by Overfinch, it's worth a hell of a lot more than if it was just a standard standard Range Rover. And uh, I would love, I would love to build something just like that for guitars. And I've thought about it long and hard, but I keep on coming up against the fact that the diehard fans of the companies would hate it. And uh, and on top of that, there are a few things that you there aren't that many things that you could do on a on a guitar. Cars, there's a lot more scope for experimentation. A guitar, 
swap out the pickups, which everybody does anyway. Um, swap out the hardware, and if you're starting with a good guitar already, you don't need to. And it's the finish and customizing finish and stuff, which people do do to a certain extent, but what's the point? It's, it's a, that's a very personal thing. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments. This is something that I'm, I'm particularly interested in. Dang Nabbit has sent uh, a £5 super chat and says, Any idea, roughly, when the apprenticeships will start? I have already expressed interest, but like others, will need to plan life issues around it. I have many life issues. I absolutely understand. Um, okay, so I do not think that for from a logistical point of view, it makes sense to say, okay, semester starts in September, and uh, boom, you're all going to be there. I want to give you and everybody who's going to do this apprenticeship this year-long uh, experience at Crimson the very very best experience possible and if you are among say half a dozen other people all doing the same thing then the training that you get both in the school uh, i.e the Thursday and Friday days when you're building your own guitars and w when you're working for Crimson on the other days will be lacking because you're going to be trained amongst six other people whereas if we stagger everything out it means that you will have one-on-one -on -one training with our luthier saying, this is exactly how we sand a guitar body. Now, here's 50 guitar bodies. Go and sand them. You will never forget how to sand that guitar body. But if, if you're showed with a bunch of other people, it, it'll be less effective. So what I'm saying is we will work around you. We have no hard and fast calendar except for the fact that currently the... The workshop where all of this is going to be based is has not yet been built and let me tell you it is going to be a dream workshop i am so excited vulcan has come back in says hi ben uh, i had to line i had to align shipping dates because of my travel for business and some of the delays you mentioned uh, the team was very forthcoming. Please relay my thanks to Sam, Ricky, and James. Cheers, V. Thank you very much. This is... Um, <clears throat> so so on top of actually literally uh, losing staff, there were there were some that we we said, look, thank you very much, but bye-bye. And uh, there are also a couple that uh, are not fans of what I'm planning moving forward. And don't like the new way of working, i.e., hey, we actually pay attention to what you do and don't do in a day. Uh, so on top of that, we've lost a couple of people. And then on top of that, over the last, well, we've had now, I think, 10 cases of COVID and various other major infections and health issues um, over time. So uh, it's actually all, all sorts of stuff going on. But we are... We have taken on extra staff in the customer services department and um, are doing our very, very best to be ex to do exactly what Vulcan is saying here. Uh, if there is any way that we can make something work for you, um, even if it's delayed, uh, we, we will do our absolutely best to do that. So, uh, yeah, I'm really happy to hear that. Thank you very much, V. Uh, and he's coming with another super chat. Hi, Ben. Idea for virtual teaching. Uh, a 200 or 300 euro service agreement to have a professional luthier as a consultant for a month and maximum of five sessions. Cheers, V. I've really considered doing that. Uh, and the only, the only reason we haven't done that is simply one of time. Now, the we have... Um, luthiers are a finite resource. Uh, I spend most of my time on camera, and uh, honestly, I could make a hell of a lot more money by doing exactly what you just described there. No shadow of a doubt. Um, I've been asked to consult with other companies physically and fly around the world and do things like that. And uh, I mean, it's a sop to my ego. Yeah, absolutely. But I would much rather you know, spend all week making a video that maybe 40 or 50,000 people, or sometimes a lot more, will see and and hopefully learn from and get some enjoyment from, etc. 
So the the professional luthier consultant thing would have to be shared out between the luthiers at Crimson, and the rest of them are desperately behind on what they want to be achieving build wise. And um, so we've got uh, luthiers who teach in the school and build guitars for us, and then we've got the luthiers who work on the, the production guitars and the custom shops, etc. And that department is very, very light on luthiers. Um, and we need more people. So this is something that I would love to do. It's something that comes back time and again, although I don't normally think about charging quite that much. Uh, don't hold me to that when we finally get there. Uh, but I think it's going to take a number of years before we get to the point where I have got enough guitar builders uh, who I can trust, i.e. who I've personally trained, uh, to be able to do something like this properly. And this is at the heart of why I'm going back to Crimson. I'm building this workshop and... You know, I could have my old workshop back if I wanted to and be up in the top of the building. It's a two-story building, so it would be one floor higher than everybody else. Uh, and have my workshop on my own. And I work better on my own. I love it. But I'm moving into a workshop full of people so that I can train those people. So that in two or three years' time, I've got a bunch of guitar builders working for me who I have personally taught my way of doing things. And... Uh, at that point, well, at that point, we could have 200 students. We could have people on the phone every single day, video calls, um, talking about, you know, what's wrong with my action. Here's the guitar. Look at look at the guitar. This is what's happening. Oh, try this, try that, try that. Have you got a... etc. So we're building something. We're building something that should be incredible. And uh, that's a very good idea. Thank you very much. Okay. Where are we? 97 people watching. We've been going for an hour and 16, 17 minutes. Uh, this is insane. I'm enjoying it, though. This is a good, good, good one. Okay. Uh, Crazy Steve via Discord says, We are currently arguing in the Discord about cast aluminium guitars versus ones made from a machined billet, and which is superior. I argue in theory that a cast instrument could have more intricate weight relief and is therefore the better option my adversary <laughs> sounds so serious uh, believes it would be prohibitively expensive even considering the cost of cnc machines thoughts uh, i think that if you have a cast one it wouldn't be about the uh, uh, how did you put it intricate weight relief because quite frankly with the cnc machine you can do pretty much anything like that <laughs> okay with a cast one you can create air pockets inside the instrument um through well, there are, there are methods, basically. So uh, it would have to be open somewhere for the wax to get out, etc. But you, you could do that. Uh, you could make a honeycomb kind of a thing, and that could be incredible. Um, I have seen some absolutely amazing machined uh, uh, solid aluminium guitar bodies with incredible weight relief. Uh, Drummond guitars is one that comes to mind. And uh, you you really should check them out, actually. I think it is six of one and half a dozen of the other. Personally, with a cast item, you end up with issues with finishing. Um, but long term, if you're going to make a hundred of them... <laughs> no, I think the CNC is probably better. And uh, I know I'm saying this to the man who's arguing for cast. Uh, if you're casting something like that, every single one of them is probably done individually using a uh, sand mold, basically. And it is a, a big, long, human-intensive process. Uh, you, you, you're making a, a big old mold. You push the... Um, yeah, big old mold. You push a piece in. You've got another mold that goes on top, and it, it takes time and human time 
to make this happen. Whereas with the CNC machine, it's plunk the metal on. Once you've done the drawing once, which obviously takes time, that's it. You put the material on the CNC, you push the button, and the CNC machine does its thing. And yeah, it takes, I mean, for aluminium, my big CNC, the big CNC at Crimson, could probably machine a solid billet of aluminium into a guitar, um, top and back, fully carved, beautiful, in maybe three or four hours. And I think I'm probably being quite conservative on that, to be honest. Uh, it is a metalworking machine, after all. Whereas every single one of a cast aluminium electric guitar would have to be would have the same amount of human time into it so you make you make the the master which takes hours and hours and hours and then you use that master to make the molds and it takes hours to put the mold together and tamp all of the, the sand and and all of that jazz um, you've got people at the forge uh, casting the metal into it you've then got your areas where the metal has gone down into the thing once it's cured you then have to chop those off and sand and file and finish and all that cnc is the way nobody's talking about 3d printing because for a million quid you can buy a metal 3d printer machine and do the same thing but it goes back to something that i asked earlier what is the point of an aluminium guitar. Why do we all think it's this cool thing that should be done? It looks quite cool, but unless it's heavily anodized, it's soft as, scratches show up in a fraction of a second. Um, you can't touch it without it starting to look tarnished and, and, and weird. Um, so unless it's anodized, what's the point? In, and if you're talking about color, color anodizing, it just looks like you sprayed a piece of wood. Uh, if it's a tone point of view, fine. If you like that sort of metallic-y kind of sound, that's that's a valid thing. I personally don't like playing aluminium-bodied guitars because they're quite cold, literally. Uh, they also move more. So wood reaches an equ equilibrium and it just is what it is. But aluminium will take on the heat of the room. So if you go from a cold touring van to a hot, hot, hot venue, your instrument is going to fundamentally change pitch and keep on fundamentally changing pitch throughout the evening uh, until you just chuck it in the corner and don't use it. Now, the final question I'm going to ask you is, when do you think the first aluminium guitar was manufactured? <sighs> I'm not going to leave this as a, as a major question. Uh, the first, uh, al the, the commercial process by which it was made valid to mass produce aluminium was in the 1880s, maybe early 1890s, if I recall correctly. The first aluminium guitar was made in the 1890s. Obviously, it was an acoustic style instrument. This is not new technology. It is one of the most commonly available materials of, that, that we have access to. And if, if it was a commercially viable thing to make aluminium guitars, well, Fender would have used it, or Ibanez, or you know, any number of mass producers, because you know, they're here to make money. And there just isn't a reason to do it, short of, hey, and I'm tempted to do it myself. I've got the CNC of Crimson. It's just, hey, I can do this. It looks pretty damn cool. Uh, go, let's do it. Lucifer says, um, uh, that is getting, this is that though. Oh, I see. He says, I use this stream as a consulting tool. Send in your super chats, people, he says, uh, uh, while sending in a super chat. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. This is... This is Luther's Consulting. Send me a 10 quid super chat and, and I'll answer any questions you might have. Uh, saying that there are a couple I need to, to get to. So Kenneth Gordon has sent five US dollars and said, uh, thank you. Spot on with the car customizing reference. Factory second wholesale is a good source. Uh, recently broken neck pocket guitar to headless neck through bass. 
guitar, headless neck through bass. There we go. Um, I hadn't even considered converting a broken headstock instrument into one with a um, headstock. Did that sentence make any sense? In my head, I went completely off piste. Um, and Joe Smyjo Jr. is coming with another $5 super chat and, chat and says, uh, not to mention that an aluminium guitar is also extremely dangerous <laughs> because it's a lightning rod. That's a good point. That is a good point. Um, so, <sighs> yeah. Okay. Kenneth, thank you very much. Yes, um, the car customizing stuff is... It's always given me thought. Um, and uh, there are a lot of factory seconds. I've seen... There was one supplier in the UK that bought a load of Washburn factory seconds that just slightly damaged uh, in strange ways that were easy to fix that they just didn't bother doing. But you could, you could build a whole business out of doing that. You absolutely could. Um, Joe, so uh, an aluminium guitar is also extremely dangerous because it is a lightning rod. That is something that I've never considered. Um, but uh, for some reason, what you've reminded me, and you've taken me straight back into that topic that I've just monologued on, I, I'm i currently wondering... Whoop, no, wrong stuff. I'm currently wondering whether if I paint one of my guitars with rearguard shielding paint, uh, if I will be able to then chrome plate that guitar. I suspect I would. But if I've got an aluminium guitar, I can I can properly copper plate. You can maybe hmm. Whoops. Hold on, I'm gonna Google that quickly. Or let me know. Uh New chrome plate aluminium. Anodized aluminium can be chrome plated as well. Woohoo! So there we go. I something that I've often wanted is a relatively inexpensive way to properly chrome plate a guitar. And chrome plating wood is a bastard of a process. I've never done it, but I've spoken to people who have. Um, and it's also hit or miss. Whereas if you make an uh, a relatively lightweight body, excuse me, uh, a relatively lightweight guitar body out of CNC machined aluminium, you can then anodize chrome plate, gold plate, actual gold plated guitar. Ho oh, ho ho ho, that sounds so fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, Fender did hollow bodied aluminium guitars. Uh, not mass, but, uh, sorry, and, that, and that's my point. A lot of people have made them, a hell of a lot of people made them over the time, but they're not something that the customers want to buy. It's not commercially viable because nobody buys the damn things. Um, and he mentioned that uh, da, 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 the Harley Davidson model was chromed. And again, various people have chrome guitars. There's a guy in the UK that does it. Um, and it's it's hit or miss. It's it's not it's not an easy process. It has been done. It does look cool. Uh, Steve Vai played a chrome one, or was it Satriani? I always get the two combined, and that actually makes me feel really guilty. Whew. Okay. Is carbon fiber more of a lightning rod? How interesting. Hmm. You guys are going to have to let me know on that because I have got no clue. All right, this stream is going on and I'm still having fun though, so uh, so let's go. Satriani's Chrome Boy is one example. There we go, Satriani. Andrew Kumiski says, change in subject. In the past, you mentioned a hand tool church. Can I be a bishop? How much will it cost? I can preach the truth. Uh, <laughs> I uh, uh, So there's a, 
there is a religion, I, th- I think it's in Sweden, maybe, and they've managed to get official status as a religion, and it is based on control C, control V, copy and paste. And and if they can do that, why the hell can't we have a hand tool church? Uh, it is often said that um, uh, that founding your own religion is a, is a license to print money. So uh, um, you know why not do it about hand tools? And uh, it's yeah, I think that could be incredible. Ooh, there's a super chat. Hold on. Now let's see. Okay. Hugh McKay, staying in the theme of hand tools, says, What's your thoughts on toothing planes for leveling acoustic top and bottom and then using a scraper? Vintage as new don't seem to be made, so no one uses. Uh, okay, so I've got a low angle. This is my Lee Nielsen number 62. And uh, this guitar... <laughs> planes and guitars are inextricably linked in my head as you can tell this plane you have the option to buy a toothed blade with it hmm. I just lied to you I just lied to you through through my teeth please forgive me this is my standing number 164 with this plane I bought a toothed iron so Lee Nielsen, at the very least, did uh, toothed irons for for these planes. And uh, I have it in a drawer somewhere, and I've n- just never used it. Um, that being said, I have access to a, uh, a, a sander thicknesser, and if I have to thickness down and acoustic back and sides, I will take it to Crimson or I will use the easy route, which is that. Uh, in the past, I have used a toothing plane or a tooth plane before, um, and it does... Well, it, it does. It does the job, and it does the job very well. Uh, you can... I do not have one here. You can buy a vintage block plane, i.e. a wooden plane, with a high angle tooth blade. They're sold as toothing planes or veneering planes. They are anywhere from 10 pounds to sort of 40 or so. Uh, there may even be some on the vintagetoolshop.com. So uh, you can, yeah, you can get one of those and you can use them and it does remove material quite nicely. Um, yeah, basically, it's a good option. It's a very, very good option. And as you said, not many people even know it exists, let alone that it is so good. (sighs) Mr. Waffle says, what are the old resonators made of? Steel? Uh, I think so, yes. Joe Smile John Jr. is coming with five dollars again. Thank you very much. It says, isn't the Shinto Saw Rasp technically a toothed plane? Ha! I've seen them in hand plane design. Um, sort of. It's it's more of a file saw than anything else. Due to the way due to the way that the tool works, basically, uh, due to the way that the blades work. It creates sawdust rather than shavings. So not quite, but I see, yeah. Yeah. Dang Nabbit says, I want a chrome plated guitar. So do I, so do I. (sighs) Okay. David Spears says, hey Ben, planning my GGBO 22 build, uh, Les Paul Jr. with a piezo bridge and a humbucking P90. I need to build myself a piezo guitar. Uh, Any suggestions for a piezo bridge? Um, Les Paul Jr., so Tunematic, I I would, well, uh, (laughs) Graftech. Graftech are the people to go for for piezo. They just are. And it's not just because of the actual 
the actual bridge, the actual quality of what they make, it is the acoustophonic um, preamp is incredible. Yeah, 100%. Ben Timon says paper mache guitar. I am going to do that one day for sure. There are paper mache furniture. There is paper mache furniture in, still in existence that's, that's survived hundreds of years. I don't see a reason why we shouldn't. <laughs> Mr. Waffles is going to make his guitar out of plaster. It'll come with a hydraulic lift. Um, I was... Many years ago, I did a stupid thing and I ended up with a broken foot. And uh, they put me in this plaster cast. And it was one of those things that came pre-wrapped and you essentially had to break a chemical and or, or just unwrap it, I don't know. And it's set itself and it looked so freaking cool. And I was like, oh my God, I want to make a guitar out of this stuff. And that was many, many years ago. And I have, yeah. Yeah. More to do. Huh. Wow. Okay. So Vulcan has just uh, emailed through some images of uh, this SG that he's built with a uh, either alligator or very big snake skin finish. And he's used the uh, grain enhancing fillers on it. I can't really this is here we go i'm going to show my screen to your screen and uh, that looks super cool um, i should get to a point where i i need to get to a point where i have these images and i can just flip them up onto onto here and show you but uh, we're not there yet okay okay steven uh so sc guitars <laughs> It's got an important question. It's got two questions here. First one is, how much debt is too much debt to get into for guitar building? Asking for a friend. Um, avoid debt as much as possible, people. If you if you have, in all seriousness, budget constraints, then um, by all means, build a guitar, but then reuse the hardware and, and etc. as much as humanly possible. That's what I did. I had zero money when I started. Uh, in fact, I have sold my tools multiple, I own a tool shop now, but I sold my tools multiple times throughout the process just to pay rent. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, and uh, another relatively inexpensive way of doing it is uh, to get uh, clunkers on eBay and then take the hardware off that and, uh, and, and build. Uh, you can recycle fretboards and necks and tuners and da, 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 all the stuff. So there are ways around it, but uh, yeah. I am the worst. I have been the worst for financial uh, jurisprudence. What's the word? I, I'm shit with money. <laughs> I have been historically utterly shit with money, and I'm probably still not great. So yeah, be careful. Um, okay, so SE Guitar says double shouldered guitar straps, Batman. Here's a hot topic I want to talk about. Matt Heafy, my musical idol, has a custom strap system with his Richter that puts the weight of his guitar across both shoulders. My question is why aren't we all doing this and why hasn't it caught on? Because it looks a little bit shit. It looks a lot a bit shit. It looks like shit. And guitar players want to look cool and that's i think what people's minds go to so yeah um why isn't it caught on from an ergonomic and postural stand um uh, from a posture point of view it seems to be the way to go uh it seems like it would, it would completely alleviate the need to worry about neck dive when building slash purchasing guitar yes absolutely uh Yes, 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 and yes, and yes. And if it could be made to look a little bit less crap, then it's the way forward. And quite frankly, it could. Um, so looking at people Google the image, Google an image of this. He's got a he's got what looks like a ratchet strap system around the center of uh, the waist of his Les Paul. So he's got a strap going up here and then going down to his normal strap and his normal strap there. You could put another strap button on the middle of the guitar 
and have a three strap system absolutely fine um, and there are ways that people people do that so yeah it should be done that way but again we're stuck in the 50s people v has come back with another five euros um it says hey ben uh, with regards to my buzz question, is the fret rocker still a diagnosis tool once you adjusted the neck relief? I just checked and it does rock. Cheers, V. So, it, it, to a certain extent, yes, but also no. It's a really difficult one. Once you've got neck relief in um, okay you've got a high fret you've absolutely got a high fret i would straighten the truss rod and have a look at it again and see what happens but uh, with, with with neck relief yes there is a possibility due to how the truss rod works that you will then end up with a gap but it shouldn't be a very big gap the whole point of leveling the frets is that while you might have a half millimeter gap at the 12th fret, the gap between your uh, your first and your second fret, for example, should be basically nothing. So yes, the fret rocker should be able to say, mm, yeah, uh, you've got a problem here um, because it's, it's so small. Now, if you've got a huge relief, no, the fret rocker is essentially useless at that point. If you've got a, a really big you know, action, but um, but if it's looking like it's rocking at this point, then uh, yeah, I would straighten the neck out just with the strings on even, and and use that to see and see what's happened. Sometimes your um, just the act of stringing a guitar up and playing around with the uh, with the truss rod etc. Uh, can pop frets out, and uh, yeah. It, it might have been absolutely perfectly level beforehand, but uh, maybe you strung it up too soon after the, the, the frets were glued in. I know I'm an impatient person when it comes to guitar building. Um, and uh, the tension and the pressure has just popped a few frets out and you need to go in and uh, use a fret setting tool to, to whack them back and, and, and level again or spot level, etc. It's, uh, it's infuriating, but I do understand. Scott de Bockler. How's it going, Scott? I don't think I've seen you here before. Welcome to the chaos. Uh, it says, Stuart Semple is making a mirror paint now that looks promising as far as making a chrome guitar. I have been watching that. Um, I have been watching that uh, here on my notes again. Stuart Semple chrome. I'm going to get... I'm just going to go and buy pretty much everything they do <coughs> um, and have a bit of a play. I think that could be cool. If people are allowed to become third-party resellers of his things. Uh, you know, ultra black paint has guitar building written all over it, doesn't it? Okay, we've been going for ha, nearly two hours. My wife thought she might be asleep when I came home. Um... Stephen Clark says, so says suspenders for guitars? Question mark. I dig it. It's been a lot worse over the decades. That's from Rab Knox. Papier Maché would be a good band name, Mr. Waffles. Uh, Lewis McGriff says, uh, yes, 100% uh great artists make horrible business people lol i can relate so uh talk so okay I, I mentioned last week that i had just had a conversation with somebody who was going through the process of being diagnosed as uh, having adhd and i've always thought to myself yeah maybe i have that and then not really you know but i am i am now going through the process myself of getting properly formally diagnosed, I am absolutely certain, like, it is scary how many of the pointers are my life. And I'm very interested to see 
how much of a better business person I become uh, <laughs> when they start pumping me full of amphetamines. Um, but uh, one of the one of the issues is that artists really do tend to make horrible business people, ADHD or not. Um, I have learned how to how to deal with all of that by by working with some incredible people and having the, the the luxury to be able to find people who are fantastic at business and then just say <laughs> take it you bastards i'm gonna go to my shed and build guitars you deal with the the, the banks and the lawyers and the hr and all of that crap because i just don't want to know um give me a camera give me some wood and some chisels and i'm away um and if you are lucky or and or clever about it you can do exactly the same thing find somebody who can work with you who has those bits those things that you don't have and run with it and uh, if it if you're lucky uh, it'll work out but uh, yeah it's a difficult one Lucifer says Matt Heafy plays ridiculous heavy guitar. Okay. Well. Derek Keller says I'm working with a cheap kit where the center line is off, putting my own top on it. I'm having trouble placing the center line myself since everything else is off. Um, I'm assuming, okay, kit says it's already got a neck pocket. I would put the neck in and then run a long meter rule off the outside two edges of the fretboard just draw a line right down the instrument and uh, then bisect that that should be your center line uh, i i yeah losing a center line is not fun <laughs> lewis Van grove says yep it sounds oh, no, oh i lost you now dag nama Sounds like what I found on my base. I had only 14 bad frets out of 24. Um, thanks to Ben and this chat, I'm rocking sweet. Fantastic. Fret work is one of those things. It really is. Mr. Waffle says, I had to bang in a fret on my kid's Squire bullet. It was coming up. I used CA to glue it in. Uh, that's, um, uh, yeah, one of those things. Okay, uh, questions. Uh, this is Derek Keller via Discord. He's currently working on a tele project with some parts I've acquired in exchange for doing odd jobs and setups. It's a good way to do it. That's, the, a barter, we should, yeah, barter system is great. Um, the neck that I have is a fender with the fender logo, I assume, which is in excellent condition, and I have no interest in refinishing it. Are there moral qualms about leaving the fender logo on there? If I sold, I would, of course, make it apparent in the listing that it was a parts caster. Um, wow. With moral things, you need to be the judge in the end. But uh, I would suggest that maybe on the back of the headstock, you just add or screw in your logo or do a screen print or something like that. Uh, just to say, you know, parts caster, if it's, if it's in the guitar, it's not about you selling it. That's the thing. You know, when you sell it, your eBay listing says, hey, yeah, I took a fender neck and I, I made a cool-ass body and check this thing out. It's fantastic. Buy it. Give me a thousand bucks. Um, when he goes to sell it, because, you know, we, we as guitar builders tend to flip things and, and or, or players, sorry, tend to keep love for a year or two, then they want to move on to the next endorphin rush, don't they? So uh, yeah, I would I would personally have something on the guitar that says physically and, and indelibly, I've customized this. But that's up to you. Crazy Steve one ninety says, uh, oh, we, that was the uh, uh, that was the aluminium guitars. Okay. Uh, Joe Smyjohn Jr. I like that guitar. That's pretty cool. 
Um, I need to do a. I do need to do a, a travel guitar at some point. Okay. Anyway, look, we are really pushing nigh on two hours now so uh, if there is anybody that has another question then please uh hit me up lewis wingrove says the medications will curb your creativity watch out i had to deal with it naturally which wasn't easy this is this is the worry um but i I've, I've been told that there are levels and uh I am not going to voluntarily curb my creativity, but it would be nice to. Uh, it would nice. It would be nice to learn how to not procrastinate. Quite so much as I do, shall we say? Anyway. Tommy Transplant says Willie Nelson has been using a suspenderish guitar strap for decades. Trigger is my spirit animal. Um, Trigger is one of the coolest guitars in existence. You are correct. Um, okay, Joel, thanks for watching. Have a good one, man. Um, okay. Yeah, a lot of people talking about... Um, uh, ADHD drugs and how difficult it is to get the dose right. I am, um, I well, I'll keep you guys. This is going to be an interesting journey for me and for everybody involved. Uh, you guys watch me, and you're external, and uh, not in the process. And if you start to see issues that are negative in the videos and the, the uh, and everything, please call me out, um, because uh, yeah, I, I really do feel like. Um, we're involved in a, in a f f far more <sighs> integral way than uh, many people would believe is the case. There is no cheesy, non-cheesy way to say that. But yeah, let me know. Uh, Marshall Levine says, I like Patsy work, so I've been considering learning to do fret work. Uh, since my boyfriend buys cheap pawn shop guitars that clearly need work, I don't play, but I think this is something that I can get good at. Absolutely. Um, you don't need to be a player to know to to know what a playable guitar feels like and should feel like. Um, Rab Knox says, finding somebody who would work with me or who I could put up with, that would be something. Um, that is a... Uh, yeah... I I struggled. I, well, I struggled. My first business apprentice in his interview, I said, hey, you might be the boss one day, and he's the boss now. So it worked. Uh, Leon says, hi, Ben. How much of a pain in the ass is Buckeye Burl to use as a top? And is it possible to build a PRS-style single cut with said top on a six-day course? Hmm, I think they look really cool. Yes, they look really very, very cool. It does depend on the top. It might need some stabilizing. There's a student using Buckabell in this week, who you will see in uh, the coming Friday's uh, What's on the Bench video. It looks absolutely beautiful. PRS single cut style with said top on a six-day course, absolutely. Uh, if you were talking about building a hollow body, then I would start to worry if it, and we would talk about whether you're using six mil or, or thicker material, but building a solid body with Buckeye Bill just as a top, you should be absolutely fine. Now, uh, specifically at Crimson, you should be absolutely fine. We have resins, we have fillers, we have finishes that will work. Finishing it at home is more problematic if you don't have access to a 2K, um, to 2K lacquers and a spray booth and all of that jazz. Um, so, uh, yeah, because it, it's a particularly soft wood. But uh, no, six day course, you should be fine. Uh, although please email and check with the, uh, the Luthiers uh, beforehand. Um, yeah. Uh, Vulcan is coming with another super chat. Um, I really do appreciate this. They do keep me going longer as well. That's that's for damn true. Okay. 
Uh, hi, Ben. When do you move from hard workbench to a soft mat? Cheers. So uh, my, my laptop is on a soft mat at the moment. Um, sooner and sooner, actually. So basically the second I am done with planing and I've got anything that is remotely close to finished, I'll move on to a soft mat. And uh, I think it's... It's so much easier to avoid dents and dints and scratches and stuff um, than it is to remove them after the fact. So, yeah, and uh, we're, we're working with hard tools, we're working with planes, we're working with, well, we're chopping frets off, we've got fret ends floating around. Uh, so, yeah, I try and keep my workbench as clear as humanly possible and uh, as soft as possible, as much as possible. <sighs> SC Guitar says, amazing to see how much talk about a guitar strap we were able to make. Graham B says, ADHD is your superpower. Don't let them mess you up with their drugs. Stay as you are. There are... There are things that I... I've learned how to cope with it. I've learned how to be... I've, I've become somewhat successful. But there are also some huge negatives that um, it would be interesting to see if I could live without but also still be me so I'm going to go through the thing and if it comes to the point where I say actually no fuck these drugs then we'll, we'll do that but um, yeah we'll see but bum Mr Waffles uses a cheap yoga mat I've got an old well similar to yoga mat material I've had for years I've also got um big 400 by 900 um, uh, computer mat, uh, mouse mat that uh, works very well and uh, bits and pieces. <laughs> Raven Wolf Guitar says, oh, by the way, I had a call the other day for my business and I had to have the Tonewood conversation about acoustic versus electric. And during the call, I kept having flashbacks of Ben. Uh, see, this is the thing. You can just blame me and say, look, this guy on YouTube, he knows his shit. And Tonewood is, in an electric guitar is only a very small part of the, uh, uh, of the ingredients list. And uh, yeah, go and shout at him. Leprechaun says, Ben, quick wood questions. Any experience working with red Nara or Kingwood? Uh, the basic Nara is as hard to work with as the Amboina Burl is. I have not used red Nara, but Kingwood is... Yeah, at least what I worked with when it was called Kingwood, because these names... you, These are commercial names used by commercial wood sellers, so sometimes the, the actual species varies. Uh, was very like Brazilian rosewood, really hard, cocobola-ish, um, but beautiful. Smelled nice as well. Okay. Okay. Look. I am... I'm going to call it a day. We are like a minute under two hours. And uh, I think we've, uh, we've reached the end. We're now talking about microdosing on mushrooms to... Uh, uh, to cure, and LSD as well, apparently, to cure ADHD. And uh, uh, I'm not entirely sure just how intelligent YouTube's algorithm is and whether they can actually hear this. So let's just stop. Um, I'm going to call it a night. You guys are awesome. This has been one of my favourite live streams yet. Uh, if you haven't yet, go and check out the, uh, the podcast. And uh, I will look forward to having you back next week because i'm going to do this again dag namit luthis ah marsh is coming with a another super chat super chat thank you very much so it's a dumb observation number one luthis question time live 55 i can't drive 55 i am 55 <sighs> and you sent a five dollar super chat should have been 55 dollars come on no um don't don't do that that was a joke um okay everybody All right. Yeah, Robert R wants us to, to wants me to do a new video. 
Um, uh, okay, video wise, I am not quite ready to start a new build. It's this whole procrastination thing again. Anyway, I, I love you guys. Have a fantastic week, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.